treasure to national disgrace overnight. The lurid stories of his sexual depravity surfaced from the murky depths of his 50-year reign over our televisions. Now seen as Britain's most notorious paedophile, the popular press described his actions as those of a monster. But was there a darker motivation for his crimes? Was Savile in fact a trans-dimensional sorcerer who harvested occult energies to feed his hunger for power? James Wilson Vincent Savile was born on October the 31st in 1926. He was the seventh son. Which in ancient folklore meant you were born with magical powers. His co-workers suspected he was a witch. As a Bevin boy, Jimmy Savile's fellow miners thought Jimmy Savile was a witch. Now then, nobody but nobody ever did eight hours down a pit and came back as immaculate as the set off with white shirt and everything like that. <laughs> they were quite convinced I was a witch. <laughs> if you go to South Kirby now, you'll get some of the old miners when you say, Jimmy Savile's done well, hasn't he? Ah, and you'll look around and you'll say, he's not what you think you know. <laughs> Forces of darkness are at work there. <laughs> <laughs> He had influence over people from all walks of life. Audio has emerged from archives of a BBC Radio 1 recording of Savile's travels from 1975. It was broadcast. We don't know who the young girl is. Who's your best pal, tell me? I'm not telling No, Lidman. He's not. He is. No, he's not. Get off me. Because he's a married man. Is okay. Yes, you do. Get off. I won't. Not until oh, you're squashing. <laughs> not until you say me. Me. So I promise. I promise. That you, Jimmy Savile. <laughs> you, Jimmy Savile. Are the only one. Are the only one. In my life. No, you're not the only one in my life. And Noel Edmonds and all their mothers is definitely one. Ooh. Get off. Who's your best pal? You as a pal, get off my backside. Hey? I beg your pardon? In front of your mummy and daddy? <coughs> Goodness gracious. A stray television crew, a dozen reporters, a thousand autographs. He attracts attention like a Roman candle. Jimmy Savile feeds off people. Jimmy Savile liked to mix with people from all walks of life. By day, crisscrossing the country to meet the man on the street, and by night, hobnobbing with the rich, famous, and influential. Here are just a few of the people he knew or had associated with. The Beatles, Peter Sutcliffe, The Pope, Ephraim Katzir, Elvis, Esther Ranson, Margaret Thatcher, Ted Heath, Gary Glitter, Norman Tebbit. I remember so well you at Stoke. Diana Spencer, Prince Charles, Prince Philip, Frank Bruno, Alan Franey, and many, many, many police chiefs. Sava was also a Knight of Malta, a Knight Commander of St. Gregory, and a Knight of the Realm. Jimmy Savile seemed to know everybody, yet nobody seemed to know Jimmy Savile. Publicly, he played the part of court jester, but privately, he held an almost Jedi-like position of influence over the highest and lowest life forms of British society. What was it that made Savile so popular? Was it his looks, his wit, or his charm? 
or was it something more sinister? In October 2012, the Sunday Sport, the only British newspaper still bold enough to print uncensored stories, quoted Savile discussing how he discovered he could hypnotise girls. To demonstrate, you'll see, and choosing a girl who was already fast asleep in her easy chair, I stood behind her, passing myself off as first her mother, then her father, you'll see, and finally boyfriend. We had a lively patter going. I was convinced she was awake, you'll see, and just playing along with me. Taking again the part of her mother and asking her what she was doing in bed with all of her clothes on, sweet horror, did she not stand up, you see, and start to undress? Telling her to stop, and in the nick of time, as it had been a warm evening, she was handed to her girlfriend with instructions to be put to her bed. The next morning, you see, expecting to be denounced and dismissed, I was shattered with relief when she stood next to me in the breakfast queue and gave not the slightest sign of recognition, you see. Now then. Years later, in the Isle of Man, I met Joseph Carmen, one of the great hypnotists, telling him the story. He was not surprised, you see, and suggested I should study under him and not finish up in the nick. The Isle of Man is well known as the centre of Wicca in Britain, where Gerald Gardner, the father of modern witchcraft, ran a museum devoted to the faith. What I remember so well is taking him into the Palace of Westminster. I've taken many guests in over the years, but he's the only one who was simply waved through security. He used magical signs and language. Let's analyse the phrase jingle jangle. It can be broken down into two words. Jingle, a catchy array of words in prose or verse. And jangle, which means to chatter, argue noisily or whine. Although both share the same Germanic root, jingling, jingle evolved to mean a catchy song in an advert and jangle to mean a whiny or discordant sound. However, we have also noted the yin-yang, phonetic, abstract, onomatopoeic nature of the phrase. Jingle jangle is also an autological phrase. It describes itself. It is both a jingle and a jangle. In the occult world, language is an extremely powerful tool. Since ancient times, magic words have been used by magicians to cast spells and invoke spirits. Some are well known to us now, but others have remained obscured through the ages by the secret groups who still use them to this day. This is why we spell words. Take a word like abracadabra. Abracadabra is an incantation used as a magic word in stage magic tricks. The first known mention of the word was in the 3rd century AD in a book called Liber Medicinalis. During the Great Plague, Londoners were said to have posted the word on their doorways to ward off sickness. Alistair Crowley, the infamous magician, regarded it as possessing great power. He said its true form is abrahadabra. So even a seemingly harmless word can have a more deep and esoteric meaning, and a much more powerful and potentially harmful effect than presumed. It all depends on the intention. When words are repeated three times, it is said to increase the effectiveness of the phrase. This is an ancient belief known to us as the rule of three. Its use is largely unconscious. We prefer things in threes. It suggests wholeness or completeness, and although it features heavily in many religious texts, it is also encoded into our modern myths. There's no place like home. No! 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 Education, education, and education. Words. 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 There's no place like rain. There's no place like rain. Now then, 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 now
Did Savile use this phrase to create a specific mind state in his audience? By repeating the words now and then three times, was he attempting to penetrate deep into a subconscious level of the psyche? And was he deliberately using two opposing words now and then to further confuse and mesmerise? Once under his spell, the nation was powerless to the persuasive nature of the magician who could manipulate perception of reality for his own gratification. You could say he groomed a nation. Jimmy Savile loved the limelight and crowds loved him. Jimmy was a wonderful man, his public face is well known, but we knew him much more as an uncle. He was a very good friend. He was a, a very special man. You've got to go a million, billion miles to find another man like him. You know, I mean, a class amongst himself. But I have a magic chair. It does all sorts of things. One, two, three. Hey, presto. Hospitals have rules with patients and things like that. Well, because I'm dyslexic when I want to be, I don't understand rules. This is Jimmy Savile's former home in Glencoe, Scotland, which was vandalised after the recent deplorable revelations about his life. Notice they call him the Beast. Alistair Crowley was a notorious English occultist wizard and founder of Philemic Philosophy, which was summarised by the rule, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. He was also known as the Great Beast 666. The popular press of the day dubbed him the wickedest man in the world. Sound familiar? It's interesting to note the 11-pointed star design on the front of Jimmy Savile's wizard gown. This polygon is known as a hendecagram and is a central symbol, or sigil, of Crowley's Thelema religion. It is the union of the pentagram with the hexagram or the five-pointed star with the six. It represents the man-god standing face to face as an equal opposed to his creator or destroyer. It is also a symbol of the Tree of Life, the central emblem of the mystical Kabbalah. Stones, he told Beatles, 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 Beatles. It has been well noted elsewhere that many bands from the 1960s were influenced by Alistair Crowley and Thelema, including the Beatles. Here, on the cover of Hell, we see the Beatles performing the signs of the greats of Alistair Crowley's religion, A Star, A Star. It was 20 years ago today. The opening line to the track Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band is said to be a reference to the anniversary of Crowley's death 20 years previously. Here's Crowley on the cover, positioned second in line to the Vedic yogi Sri Yukteswar Jiri. The Mano Cornuto, or Horned Hand, is the hand sign symbolizing the pagan horned god. Here are the Beatles on a photo shoot for the Yellow Submarine album. Notice that Paul is doing the OK sign, and John is doing the Mano Cornuto. In this image, John decides to stick with his horned hand gesture, while Paul switches his OKs to an owl face. start straight off with a letter from Winslow in Cheshire. Jimmy Savile knew the Beatles well. In the early days he booked the Beatles and he was a club promoter. He then went on to tour with the Fab Four at the height of their fame, where he acted as compere and master of ceremonies. In the 1960s, Jimmy Savile and the Beatles were the British pop industry. Both helped to usher in a new era of music, Savile as DJ and Top of the Pops presenter, and the Beatles who spearheaded the British invasion of America. If it is quite obvious the Beatles were influenced by the occult and the magician Crowley, is it too outrageous to suggest that Savile could have also been? God is the fabric of everybody's life, and God is the fabric of my life, no more religious or less religious than anybody else, so I would not say that I'm a religious man, but I do know who the boss is. Or, anyway, God is all over, not necessarily up there. If the good Lord, when he was doing his thing, if he bothered about people not seeing eye to eye with him, he would have got nowhere, and a lot of us would have got nowhere into the bargain. 
So therefore, you've got to square your shoulders and you've got to stand up to be counted. Mm -hmm. And you haven't really got to pay too much attention to whether people think that you're not doing the right thing. As long as your conscience is clear, then you're okay. I'm not constrained pretty well by anything. The tough thing in life is ultimate freedom. Ultimate freedom is the big challenge. Now, I've got it, and I can tell you there's not many of us that have got ultimate freedom.